Well, hello to everyone who's joining us on uh, Stanley Princeton's first Ask Me or Ask an Expert Anything uh, series. Um, we hope this is the first of many. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with this type of format, the intention is to be a little less formal than a typical webinar or presentation where you have a panelist that presents slides and then there's a Q&A and ask me anything or ask an expert anything is uh, sort of started on Reddit um, and now um, we're seeing them being done you know uh, over Zoom or other types of social media platforms so uh, there won't be a formal presentation um, but this is an opportunity for folks in Princeton who want to talk to someone and ask questions about um, renewable energy, um, how local governments can help spur the demand for renewable energy. Um, so we've brought Bruno Sarda, who is one of our board members here, and I'm going to get to introductions in a minute. But the first thing I want to do is launch a poll. So please bear with me. Um, since this is the first time we're, we're doing this type of format and using Zoom for um, an event. Um, I hope this will go through, but we wanna get some sense from the people who are attending what other topics you would like us to have um, covered in a future Ask an Expert Anything. So if everyone who's on the call um, could take a few minutes to answer this quick question which is what other sustainability topics would you be interested in learning about uh, in an Ask an Expert Anything session? So we've got some options here that you can choose. So if you wanna pick your top three or top two, that would be really helpful. And we'll give a few minutes and leave this up so folks have a chance to answer. And uh, then we'll see what the results of the poll were. Okay, about 84% of folks have voted. Given another 30, so All right, so I'm gonna end the poll here and let's see what our results were. Wow, 65% wanna hear about the state of recycling in New Jersey, 53% native uh, plants and invasive species, and 53% electric vehicles and charging at home. Well, this is very useful, so we will look to um, find some folks that can help talk about these uh, topics in future sessions. So stay tuned and hopefully um, we'll have something in the next few weeks on these particular topics. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, so Bruno Sarda is um, uh, the president of CDP North America, which is an organization that's committed to increasing environmental disclosure and action among companies and local governments. He previously served as the chief sustainability officer for NRG. He's also a faculty member and senior sustainability scholar at Arizona State, Arizona State University. And he served on the board of Sustainable Princeton since 2019. And he was also on the Princeton Climate Action Plan Steering Committee. A um, little bit about CDP, they're a nonprofit charity that runs global disclosure systems for investors, companies, cities, and states um, to help manage their environmental impacts. And over the past 20 years, they've created a system that's resulted in unparalleled engagement on environmental issues worldwide. So Bruno, over to you. Well, thanks, Christine, and uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's kind of weird because I can't see any of you, but I can see that uh, we have a little 
participant counter there. So at least I know I'm speaking to somebody. So it's great. I uh, hope everybody's doing well, uh, doing well at home. Um, so yeah, I think the, the, the purpose of this is really to be kind of a place where you get to ask questions. And, uh, and I think uh, Christine, right, they said you can, they can drop their questions into the Q and A box and then you'll, you'll kind of keep an eye and then throw them out my way. Um, yep. Just thought I'd say a few things just to set the, the, the context for, for, for tonight um, and some of the questions around this idea of how do communities play their role in, in advancing the state of renewable energy deployment in the country. One is the why, right? So when you look at U, uh, U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, the, the emissions that contribute to climate change, um, <clears throat> Latest numbers is about 29% comes from uh, transportation, right? So cars, trucks, buses, et cetera. About 28% is power generation. Uh, for actually decades, power generation used to be number one. It only got surpassed a couple of years ago, actually, by transportation with the, uh, the decrease um, of the energy or carbon intensity of the, of the U.S. power grid. Um, and then some of the other ones are things like industry, agriculture, et cetera. So, that you know really helps to set the stage for the importance of the transition to renewables and power generation and the importance of you know decarbonizing uh, or reducing the carbon intensity of the power grid as we look to electrify transportation so because since transportation is really the single largest source of emissions in the US as we shift to a more electrified uh, transportation it's important to also you know, achieve a, a much lower carbon profile for the electricity we use for electrified transportation and for everything else we use electricity for. Um, in terms of the role of cities, you know, cities are um, in the US especially really kind of ground zero for, for some of the most exciting work in climate action and environmental leadership. Um, and so you see a lot of things, for example, over 150 cities have committed to sourcing 100% renewables even for, for their own operations. I'm sure you've got cities like Berkeley, California, Cambridge, Massachusetts, large cities, right, like New York or Los Angeles, but also cities like Atlanta and Cincinnati and Boise and Orlando. And actually Houston just announced a few days ago that they're gonna source 100% of their power um, from renewables through NRG Energy, actually, which is just here in our backyard in Princeton. Uh, but you also have cities like Moab, Utah, and Missoula, Montana. And so the, the point here is that the role that cities are playing in embracing renewable energy really crosses geographies, uh, geographies crosses certainly uh, party lines, and it's really, a, um, it's really a thing, it's really a movement. And uh, uh, in some cases, most of these cities, it's <clears throat> committing to 100% renewables in the power they use, so the power if you will, procured and used by city operations and whether it's wastewater treatment, whether it's in the buildings the cities occupy, but obviously cities are made up of people. And so a lot of cities, including Princeton, have taken an approach of how do we also encourage more renewable energy use by our citizens. Um, and some of the different ways renewable energy procurement takes place, right? Uh, in some cases, it's, it's like direct install, right? If you put solar panels on your roof or on your parking lot or in, uh, in some unused land you have, uh, you are physically contracting for that power to be installed, although actually that power ultimately feeds into the grid and then the electrons that come back to your power outlet may or may not be from the solar panels on your roof or in your parking lot. You also have things like retail contracts. So actually New Jersey is a competitive state um, along with about 15 other states in the country where you can choose to buy your power from somebody other than the company that delivers it to you. For example, in New Jersey, all of our, at least in this part of New Jersey, all of us get our power delivered by PSCNG, but it doesn't mean that's who we have to buy our power from. We buy our power delivery and distribution and transmission from PSCNG, but the power itself, not necessarily, and so that's the role of, of basically retail contracts as, as, for example, at my home, I buy my power from uh, uh, Green Mountain Energy, which uh, sells, uh, uh, you know, basically green energy uh, uh, contracts. You can also do that as a commercial entity like the city of Houston just did by, with NRG. Um, cities, and we'll talk about that, can do things like these renewable energy aggregation, sometimes also called consumer or community choice aggregation, they have different names. Um, 
Companies especially also sometimes do what's called PPAs or power purchase agreements, sometimes VPPAs, virtual power purchase agreements, uh, where basically, again, they contract directly with renewable developers for some of their operations. But again, um, these are not the physical delivery of that power. It's basically a commercial contract for power being generated on their behalf. Um, and then in some cases, you're literally just benefiting from the grid. For example, if you use power at night in Texas, you're mostly using wind power because the Texas grid now is, is close to 35% renewables, mostly wind. So there's different ways all of us get renewable power. But um, I think what's important is to separate the distinction between physical delivery of power uh, and then the commercial, if you will, kind of procurement of electricity. A um, couple more things I'll say before we go into Q&A. One is um, how this works roughly. Basically, when somebody produces renewable energy, they basically get a, um, a contract or a certificate called a REC, right, a renewable energy certificate, which guarantees that they produced that unit of electricity uh, from a re renewable source. And then that REC or that contract, that certificate becomes basically a commodity that can be traded uh, and or purchased. And so I think that's a lot of what we'll talk about tonight is the role of these things. Um, uh, the electrons that actually power, you know, the screen that I'm looking at you from, or that actually you're looking at me from right now, um, are, you know, dictated by whatever kind of mix of power generation is alive on the grid at any moment. You know, the electricity generation in this country, actually pretty much everywhere, is, is on demand. So, so power companies produce power in real time uh, based on uh, demand, on, you know, where power is being used and what assets are available to the grid at any given time based on different price formation or profiles. So as of right now, you know, all of us here in the Princeton area probably have a mix of maybe some, some uh, nuclear, uh, probably a mix of gas, a mix of renewables, who knows what else. Um, again, there's, uh, this can literally change and will change to some extent uh, by the time uh, we're done with this call. So the physical production of electrons and how that gets distributed to our homes and businesses is, is um, you know, generated by uh, a market that New Jersey is part of called PJM, uh, that is a grouping of states. Um, uh, but the fact that, you know, some of us, including myself at my home, you know, choose to pay for 100% renewable elect electricity generation doesn't mean that the electrons that come to my house are 100% from these renewable assets. It just means that somewhere uh, in the area, the power that was generated from a renewable source was basically retired in my name, those, those renewable energy certificates. Um, and um, last thing I'll say, and then we can go to, to Q&A, Christine, is, is renewable projects get financed and built because there are buyers ready to buy the power. Actually, there are no what's called merchant renewable power plants, where basically you go build a plant and then you try to sell that power at whatever wholesale price is prevalent at the time. Uh, that's true in some parts of Texas with things like uh, uh, gas and coal, for example. But um, in certainly in areas like New Jersey and PJM, these these power plants, including renewable power assets, get built basically once all the power for them has already been sold and contracted. That's how the project gets financed. Basically, you can't really get financed for a renewable project if you don't have buyers lined up committing to buy your power actually over a decent amount of time. That's what those PPAs are for, those power purchase agreements. Um, and so when people like us, either individually at our homes or through a city program, like what Princeton is launching, commit to buying power um, from renewable sources, that creates a demand signal that then invites more development onto the grid. It doesn't mean tomorrow, there's more, but it just means, you know, just like any of us, if we start buying more and more organic food or electric vehicles, it sends a demand signal to those who make those things that there's a market demand and they're going to bring more of that, that to market. So just wanted to kind of set that context on that topic. Um, I know there's these programs of, of renewable energy aggregation, community choice can sometimes be confusing, the difference between kind of the physical delivery of power and kind of the market instruments that allow us to, to create demand and ultimately uh, uh, finance mechanisms for renewable assets. But um, I'll leave it there. Um, and Christine, happy to, to go to questions now. Okay, thanks, Bruno. Um, actually, the first question we got is someone wants to know what my background is. And uh, I, it's, a, it's a photo from somewhere in Princeton. I, I don't recall the location, but uh, 
thanks for asking that. Um, but for folks, as a reminder, at the probably at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q and A icon, so you can type in your questions there. Um, we did have some questions come in before uh, the event, which um, I'll ask. Um, one has to do with you know just switching to a third party supplier like Constellation New Energy, which is the um, third party that the government has, that the local government has contracted with, um, increase emissions. Will it increase emissions? Increase emissions. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, uh, again, the, um, the, what we're doing here is we are basically committing to buy a certain amount of renewable power mix for the grid uh, that we are part of. So we are sending demand signals uh, and, and actually buying uh, basically instruments to, to generate renewable electricity on the grid. Uh, so um, uh, there's, there's, there's no part of what we do that could cause, um, uh, if you will, uh, an increase in, in emissions. Um, I actually thought the, because uh, that, that question comes up a lot, um, you know, the EPA actually has, uh, has a whole side on this topic. Uh, you know, they, they define this, uh, this concept of the, this aggregation as, you know, customers continue to receive the same delivery and maintenance services from the local utility uh, uh, with the same bill. The only changes for customers are the sources and prices of electricity generation. So what we're doing is we're basically buying power that we may or may not take physical delivery of, but we are paying for cleaner power, and that's a fact. Uh, so there's nothing of what we're doing that could cause uh, if you will, the carbon intensity of, of the power on the grid to increase. Again, as I mentioned earlier, what that power mix is at any given time and any given day uh, will change uh, when there's lots of solar power on a particular grid. And, uh, you know, on things like rainy days, there's going to be less power from those solar assets and more power from maybe nuclear or gas or whatever. So again, the power mix changes uh, almost in real time. But what we're doing is we're actually kind of committing to buy and to create, therefore, financial demand for, um, uh, for renewable power. Okay. Uh, can you clarify what it means to retire a REC? Yeah, great question. Um, there are all kinds of compliance mechanisms associated with these renewable energy credits uh, in, in basically to ensure that they don't get, you know, sold a bunch of times, right? Uh, and so uh, the, the concept of retirement is when a re renewable energy credit or REC is created. So when a, when a renewable power asset like a solar farm or a wind farm generates, uh, let's say a unit, let's say a megawatt power, power, it gets a credit associated with that. And then that REC or that certificate then gets at some point retired, but can only be retired once. So it has a basically a, a number of um, unique identifier. And when it means retired, it means it can't be reused by somebody else. So it's not like you can produce one megawatt hour and then sell that certificate 10 times. Uh, so, so there's a one for one relationship between those who produce it and those who buy it. Okay. Um, so Constellation New Energy has a, an environmental disclosure label that they publish on their website that uh, shows it has more emissions than PSC and G, which is the default supplier. Can you talk about that? Sure. I mean, like I said earlier, you know, the all of the different power generators that make up the certainly the, the New Jersey grid and this this thing uh, PJM, which is the basically this grouping of states uh, that are collaborating in, in power generation. So when we're using power in New Jersey, actually some of that power may come from Pennsylvania, maybe some of it comes from, uh, um, you know, other places. Um, but uh, so any one of the operators on the grid will have a slightly different profile. For example, PSEG has a, a you know, substantial nuclear uh, fleet and therefore, um, that you know automatically reduces their uh, the carbon intensity of the power they generate, uh, but that just means that those players, if you will, who sell power into the grid, uh, each have a um, an asset mix. So some of it could be nuclear, some of it could be gas, uh, coal, solar, wind, uh, you know, etc. Um, 
but um, those those uh, uh, labels, if you will, basically are uh, once a year uh, they have to kind of take stock of okay, where did their power generation come from into the grid, which is again this is the physical generation relative to how much of it get went into the grid that everybody used. It's a separate uh, calculation than who they sold power to, and so in this case we are buying some of the renewable power that uh, CNE might produce, uh, which is you know, independent of what they're existing, regardless of what we do, their existing asset and generation mixes. Okay. Um, so there was a letter in this week's town topic, um, I, um, actually the last week's town topic, um, advising against taking part in the program in Princeton. Can you speak to that uh, letter and some of the, con and the concerns that were in it? Uh, from memory, maybe. Uh, I mean, I think if I can just summarize, it, I, I think that the, the spirit of the letter was something along the lines of this, this is kind of whitewashing, or in this case, I guess, greenwashing, right? That, that, that this thing that is claiming to be, you know, aiding in, in the generation of renewable electricity for New Jersey and for Princeton isn't what it pretends to be. Um, and, you know, I think these these concerns are very real and it's fine. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with feeling that way because, you know, I mean, I used to, you know, again, I was chief sustainability officer for one of the largest power company in the country. And it took me a while to understand this stuff. So this stuff's complicated. And, and again, the difference between the physical grid, so where power comes from and, and at any given time, you know, what is the mix of power hitting our, our outlets and our homes compared to, what is this, if you will, this market-based grid or, or who ultimately finances the transition of our grid? So, you know, what I can tell you is these, these community choice aggregation programs are absolutely beneficial to the greening of the grid. You know, when, you know, we switch to this in Princeton, does it mean tomorrow that your power is greener? Maybe not. Again, it's, these aren't necessarily like overnight things. This is about you know, because whatever assets exist today on the grid, you know, and us buying the renewable energy certificates, buying the RECs that are available for sale, by definition, they are, they belong to, to renewable assets that already exist. But, you know, the more we buy them, the more they get created. And when you look at a state like California, for example, that does not have a competitive power market. So basically California power consumers cannot choose to buy power, um, from somebody else than their directed utility, but they launched renewable um, uh, or community choice aggregation programs years ago. Um, uh, and you know now about 30% of the uh, California grid is, uh, or California consumers are partaking in uh, uh, such a program. And therefore, you know, it has created a huge demand signal. Uh, and you know, California, of course, is the, is the state in the country that has built and financed the, 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 the highest amount of renewable electricity. So, you know, it's, it's absolutely understandable that these programs can be confusing uh, because they seem like they are almost, you know, kind of a financial derivative of, of renewable energy, which is a fair point, but it's no less real. So the fact that, you know, when we do a program like this, we are creating an aggregated demand for power uh, that will have to be met by renewable sources. Um, and that you know, program will be rigorously managed accordingly. So the more communities like Princeton and others in New Jersey engage in this process, and which is why you know, states like California, like New Jersey, like Massachusetts, et cetera, have, have passed specific laws to enable these aggregation programs is because it accelerates the building and deployment of renewable energy um, in those states. Okay. Um, so what is the source of electrical energy that will be purchased by Constellation for the 100% renewable PCRE program, uh, fossil percent, nuclear percent, solar, wind, et cetera? This information is needed to make a decision on the PCRE program. So the 100% opt-up option for clarification is 76% class one PJM recs to be retired. Um, 
above and beyond the state RPS. So I think this, you, if you can answer the question about, you know, similar to what you're answering, what is the source of the electrical energy for that 100% project? Product? It's yeah, so so under, under um, New Jersey uh, statutes and as regulated by the Board of Public Utilities, the um, New Jersey class one renewable sources that, you know, generate those class one recs uh, include solar, wind, sorry, I'm reading because I wrote it down, solar, wind, geothermal, tidal, wave, and hydroelectric facilities of smaller than three megawatts, so not large hydroelectric, but small, uh, as well as biomass and methane gas. So you might have heard of things like landfills capture the methane that is uh, produced by rotting food and whatnot, and instead of letting go into the air, they capture that. And then if you burn that methane, uh, that uh, 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 methane gas, um, uh, then it counts as a renewable uh, resource. So those are those are the sources of, of energy production or energy generation that qualify for these types of recs. Okay. Um, to clarify Princeton's contract with Constellation, how did Constellation acquire the recs to sell? I guess I want to know how does it differ to buy them from than how PSE&G buys its energy? Uh, so, you know, CNE is not selling us the RECs, they're selling us basically the power. They're buying the RECs in order to sell us renewable power. So in order to be able to, uh, uh, to comply with the requirements of this program. So nobody's selling us RECs. What we're doing is we're basically buying power uh, um, instead of buying it from, so we, you know, our utility remains, PSCNG, the lines, the servicing, the meter reading, all of that is still PSCNG and they get paid, you know, if you look at part of your bill, roughly, roughly, I don't know about everybody, but about, I'd say about half of my bill is energy and half of it is basically, you know, overhead um, or the, you know, the fixed charges associated with transmission with all of that. So um, we're, we're buying power from CNE and, and they have to, they have to, um, uh, you know, buy and retire those recs in order to uh, basically sell us that renewable power. Okay. And those are, you know, could be very much as the same sources as whatever PSEG buys and, and others. Again, uh, um, you have different, uh, different producers and generators out there with different renewable assets. All of the, uh, uh, a lot of the um, Rooftop solar, for example, in, in New Jersey, you know, those people that say, hey, we'll come put rooftop on your, on your roof and like, you know, out of money, what, not out of pocket, whatever. They're probably selling your recs to somebody like CNE or PSCNG. Okay. Okay. Several environmental disclosure labels list the percentage of renewables in the PJM system is only 4%. Recs have been around for years, but the percentage of renewables is still very small. The CNE proposal looking at this history seems of dubious value. Why should anybody sign on? Well, I mean, that's, uh, uh, that's, that, that's the thing, right? Is that the supply has been kind of ready to be made available, although, you know, costs have been declining so much that now, um, you know, it's actually financially advantageous to go with renewables. It used to cost you more. Actually, the, the deal that the city of Houston just announced with NRG to buy 100% renewables from NRG, it says that it's going to save them $9 million a year uh, on their power bills. So, uh, uh, you know, there's definitely been some market dynamics that now, you know, there's a true um, uh, people financial advantage to going with that. Um, the... Uh, but it's also kind of increasing, right? So there was actually um, in New Jersey, you know, as of January 1st, 2020, uh, you know, 21% of the electricity sold in New Jersey must be from class one renewable sources uh, as part of the state's overall push to try to move us more into, into a renewable um, uh, transition. And so, yeah, the, the, you know, historically, it's still, I mean, when you look across the grid, I mentioned earlier, you know, Texas is at over 30% partly because they found that they have really cheap land in West Texas that has really good wind profiles. And so they built a lot of wind out there and all that wind gets transmitted uh, into their big cities. So different states have had different approaches, but uh, in our case, the advantage, uh, you know, again, the more of us uh, basically, you know, choose to buy that power, um, the more of it will get produced. I mean, these are very basic kind of supply and demand dynamics of any, of any type of market mechanism. 
I, I would add, well, Rex have been around for 20 years or so, as, as the question the questioner asked. Uh, renewable government energy aggregation has only been available in New Jersey, or you know, been making headway in New Jersey in the past few years. So you have to look at it in the context of how long this has been in New Jersey. Um, so is it possible to show the identity of an issuer of RECs that is purchased by the municipality through this program? Relatedly, do we know what market is receiving the signals we send through this program? An extreme example, would it ever be possible to trace a specific energy project to this program? You know, I, and this is kind of a little bit beyond my area of expertise, but my understanding is, uh, and you know, I was, ahead of this call looking a little bit at the, the Board of Public Utilities in New Jersey, you know, that ultimately regulates all of this. So both kind of PJM has uh, specific instructions on, you know, how RECs are managed within PJM. Um, and PJM is a private grid operator. So I don't know if they have the same transparency rules, but the Board of Public, Public Utilities for what is, you know, sold and retired in New Jersey, I believe might be a matter of public record. So I think, uh, which uh, which recs from which projects are retired by which operator uh, might be um, available through um, either the BP website or maybe through through uh, uh, you know an information request. I'm not entirely sure, frankly. Um, but I think what is more useful is to make sure that you feel confident as we do that the process and the methodology and the if you will the auditing standards around you know, what qualifies as a proper rec to be purchased and retired is more important because, you know, we don't want, you know, I mean, you know, I certainly don't expect consumers to go chase down, you know, where did this thing come from? You know, it's not kind of a farm to fork kind of, because uh, obviously with food, it really matters. Uh, uh, electrons are electrons at the end of the day. Uh, uh, by the time they get to you, that's that's the beauty of having kind of this very fungible type of grid is that we can we can put very new types of energy sources on the grid and it's completely transparent to to the end user. Okay, how do RECs affect renewable energy supply in our region? Our in all caps. How do they like in our region, like as in like New Jersey? In New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. Uh, I believe, and Christine, you probably know more about this than I do, but the uh, part of the requirement from this bid, right, so that these these had to be um, RECs from, from our load zone, right, or from, uh, uh, so the, from, these, uh, uh, the PJM region. Like, this isn't like Texas wind RECs, right? These are... No, from the PJM region um, on what uh, the BPU classifies as uh, PJM class one RECs. Right. Yeah, so they, they have to be in, in kind of the our regional grid, uh, which is not a, a requirement, actually. I believe the power I buy for my house through Green Mountain, actually some of it is from, I, I want to say, some Iowa wind projects and uh, uh, maybe some Texas wind projects as well. So, uh, but in this case, for the, for the Princeton program, um, it had to be from within the region. Okay. Why is in Princeton buying 100% renewables for us instead of making it an option? Uh, that's the first question. Uh, I think uh, I can answer that because there wouldn't have been a cost saving, so you couldn't. Uh, you had to opt up to something because there was a, a slight premium to it. Um, also, is nuclear power treated exactly the same as solar, wind, and hydro? So no, as 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 mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, nuclear is not included in the definition of um, of class one renewable sources in New Jersey. So again, uh, these were solar, wind, geothermal, tidal, wave, which is kind of same as tidal, but not quite. Uh, but anyway, ocean power, um, and then small scale hydroelectric, um, as well as biomass and, and methane gas. But uh, nuclear is not. Um, it does not qualify for, for, for class one regs. They have their own kind of classification. They get these things called ZEX or zero emission credits um, through a different program of the state, but, uh, but they are not. Uh, so when we're buying through this program, we're not financing more nuclear for sure. Great. Follow up question on Constellation's environmental disclosure label. Um, so if Constellation 
new energy reports more emissions than PSE&G, then the PCR program will increase emissions by switching. Do you agree? No. Not what you said earlier. No. No, again, the whatever their generation mix is going to be, it's going to be whatever we do. What we're doing is we're buying the portion of their generation mix that is renewable. Uh, so uh, there's nothing we do that uh, uh, it gives them an incentive to produce more uh, carbon-based power. And, and, and again, regardless of what we do, the power that goes onto the PGM grid and the power that is physically delivered to Princeton um, will not change. So, so you know, what we're doing is we're creating a demand for more renewables to be added to the grid over time. Um, but uh, uh, you know, whom we buy from, uh, frankly, is, uh, um, is 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 irrelevant in that context. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, if you buy, if you choose to buy, you know, like one of my favorite chocolate brands is uh, Tony's Chocolate Only. You know, they claim to be the slave-free chocolate, great chocolate. If you've not tried it, you can find it at Whole Foods. You can also find it sometimes at you know gas station mini marts. Um, who you buy it from? It doesn't matter. When you're buying Tony's chocolate only, you're contributing to cocoa that is being sourced from slave resources. Uh, at least, you know, per their claim. And again, really good chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Governor Murphy has announced an offshore wind farm project that may provide 50% of New Jersey electricity needs. Why should residents not simply support that project rather than a private company like Constellation New Energy? Well, these are not in, you know, mutually exclusive at all. I think, again, we all want more renewable on the grid. What we're doing now is creating the demand for those electrons, because uh, the more we create demand, private demand, consumer demand, community demand for, uh, for power, then it basically just it creates a pull mechanism for regulators, uh, investors, and developers to bring that power onto the grid so that it's not just a blunt instrument of government trying to push that boulder uphill, it's literally consumers demanding that power be added to the grid. And, you know, it could very well be that the, the electrons delivered for, uh, to Princeton through this program in the future could very, much, very well come from these up forward projects, except, you know, it's going to be years and years before um, those things, um, you know, are actually producing any power. But I, if I could expand on that, Bruno, I think also, you know, uh, investing directly into projects like that isn't available to local governments. You know, you talked a little bit earlier about power purchase agreements or virtual power purchase agreements. And um, that, that could be a future trend. That could be something that the PCRE program could evolve into um, where you are doing more direct investment to specific projects. But right now, the the, it's not really available to a local government um, mostly because the length of terms of the contract right, tend to be longer term contracts and municipalities can't enter into contracts that are that long. Um, but it is somewhere where I think we should all be looking to evolve to. Um, so I think, you know, that would be a great you know, opportunity if, if, the, if a government could actually have more direct investment with uh, a particular project or a set of projects via that mechanism of a PPA or a virtual PPA. But right now it's not available to local governments in New Jersey. Yeah, or in the case of actually, I mean, that's something we worked on actively when I was at NRG because it wasn't just cities. A lot of companies were like, yeah, I'm not signing a 15, 20 year contract for electricity. You know, when I could just, um, I could just uh, uh, buy that power, um, you know, or buy regular power from, uh, uh, from just my utility. And so what NRG that actually is, it became, if you will, the off taker. The, so uh, not the developer, but basically NRG committed to buying all the power from some projects and then gets to resell it to big commercial customers and cities without those long-term contracts. Okay. Um, what would be required for a resident of Princeton to install a system that would let them get to 100% Guarantee renewable sourced energy delivered to their home. Um. I mean, you know, today the the way um, our our systems are set up, you know, even if you have enough panels on your roof or in your backyard to power all your house, basically the way that thing gets installed is that you're still connected to the grid, and so at any given time, 
you might be putting power back into the grid and then when you're you know using power it might be drawing from the grid you know even at nrg if you've driven past the nrg campus uh, um, in uh, uh, in west windsor you see there's there's a lot of and it's solar there on the roof and the parking lot um, and but even then actually uh, by law it is connected to the grid um, even though it is technically a microgrid so the short answer to that question is, is I think, in the not too distant future, um, when we can have proper battery storage, um, uh, basically when you can have power generation on, let's say, on your roof with with wind, uh, so you know, solar uh, that basically charges a battery, so that um, you know, and that battery might have enough power, let's say, to power your home for a day or two. So you're always charging that battery, and you're always drawing from that battery so that uh, you would be basically in a closed circuit um, and you know technically could be off grid of course uh, th these days you're still on grid you can actually buy from companies like like tesla you know sells what they call their power wall it's still pretty pricey so it's not available to to everyone but that concept um, is i think what we all want in the future is that basically with uh, the, the emergence of the ability to store electricity in much larger scales. Uh, you know, we're all familiar with the little AA, AAA batteries, but you know, when we have bigger batteries that don't just power our flashlights or our, or our cell phones, you know, where we charge it overnight and then we use it all day kind of thing, same concept, but for the whole house, uh, then it'll be much easier to just, you know, know exactly, um, you know, how to close that loop. Yeah. Um. Michael Gillenwater, in articles previously sent, uh, which was uh, sent to me uh, by a resident and I shared with you, Bruno, since says, says that your green power is really just greenwashing in all but a few rare cases and documents all the reasons. Can you comment? Uh, I will mention that, uh, yes, those articles from Michael Gillenwater, we did read about those, we being the um, ad hoc subcommittee uh, that from of the environmental commission that worked on this project and so we reached out to michael gillenwater and we had a conference call with him on october 24th um, one because his research was uh, several years old so we wanted to find out what sort of the latest thinking was um, so we did speak with michael gillenwater and explained to him about the program and he did um, uh, understand what we were attempting to do and and said in this case it wasn't um, the same as what his research was, which was looking at national wind wrecks and the oversupply of those. So um, I can give that background, but uh, Bruno, I don't know if you had a chance to look at that as well, but if you have anything to add about um, Michael Gillenwater's research. You know, I can't really speak to the research. Sorry, uh, um, I was in meetings all day, so I kind of just skimmed the, uh, the general, uh, the kind of the general idea, but but what I can say again is is I think, you know, if you remember one thing from tonight, is that um, you know the way markets change is when consumer demand changes roughly, and you know there's all kinds of things we can do as governments as whatever to try to push that change onto people, uh, but the, the the fact is that um, you know. Uh, more than 50% of all new power generation built in the U.S. for the last several years now has been renewables. Uh, everything else has been gas. There's not been a single new coal plant built in the U.S. in many years. There hasn't been a new nuke plant or nuclear plant built in the U.S. in many, many years. Um, and so that's not an accident, right? It's not a coincidence. The fact that there's such a huge, you know, uh, uh, gigawatts and gigawatts and gigawatts of renewable projects being developed and connected to the grid in the U.S. is because somebody wants to buy that power and somebody is buying that power. And so there could always be maybe a disconnect by a year or two or three, you know, so maybe they just, you know, take a lot of demand, you know, build the supply um, and then, uh, you know, maybe there's, a, there's enough projects on the grid for a little while to meet the demand. But again, unless there's new demand signals, then there's not gonna be new development. So uh, the, the general idea um, uh, of how we move this grid to a lower carbon grid, how we get more renewables built and connected to the US grid, almost all of which are private financed projects, right? This isn't government going to spend a lot of money to build renewables, right? It's creating a demand either through renewable portfolio standards in various states, 
through corporate power purchase agreements that we mentioned earlier, or through city scale programs like the one we're talking about. But at the end of the day, uh, the fact that there's an aggregated demand uh, for um, renewables is what is causing renewables to be built and to be financed uh, just to give you a sense, even we talked about corporate DPAs earlier, you know, I did a lot of work on that um, and why at CDP we work closely with the RE100, you know, the Renewable Energy 100. If you add up all the collective commitments of just corporates uh, in having committed to buying 100% renewables for their business operations, that adds up to more than all of the renewable portfolio standards of all the states that have set one. So it's, it's you know, over 200 terawatt hours of Power, which is an enormous amount of energy uh, commitment from businesses saying we want more of this and we'll buy it if you build it. Uh, so that's really what we're talking about here is, is to look at the big picture of how do we you know, decarbonize the U.S. grid, how do we ensure that more and more and more renewable assets get built and developed. And again, there's years now of historical data to show that uh, the majority of power being built and connected to the grid in the U.S. is renewables. You know, again, because of that demand, it would not be happening otherwise. Okay. Um, what is the difference between Green Mountain and Constellation? Uh, they're different companies. In this case, Green Mountain is, uh, is a subsidiary of NRG, actually, uh, uh, that uh, sells power in, in states where you can choose who you buy your power from. So. Uh, um, you know, uh, many communities, as Christine mentioned, have not yet offered a program like this community choice aggregation. Uh, so um, in communities where like in, for example, all across New Jersey, anybody has the right to buy their power from a company like Green Mountain, there's others. Um, uh, so there's, there's a, a, host of, a host of companies that allow you as a consumer to, uh, uh, to buy that kind of power and, and Constellation is one of them. Um, I would also mention Green Mountain is more of a direct marketer. Um, Constellation is a third party that um, doesn't necessarily do direct marketing. Um, uh, I saw the Green Energy, Green Mountain Energy Environmental Disclosure label reports 100% renewable energy, unlike CNE's Environmental Disclosure label, which uh, says 4%. Is Green Mountain Energy's claim based on the purchase of Rex? Yes. Yeah. So the uh, Green Mountain actually doesn't produce, doesn't generate any power. Uh, they're basically a, a um, uh, if you will, an aggregator themselves, right? So, uh, so they, they, they've created a mechanism through which you can buy renewable power, but they, they buy it from, uh, you know, producers and developers. So that by not owning any um, generation assets and by only selling renewable products, um, because that's literally their, their core and only business, then therefore their, their mix, if you will. Um, but, but again, you know, even though I'm a, I'm a Green Mountain customer in my case, you know, I get my thing in my, uh, in my PG and E, or sorry, P, uh, PSCNG, I used to live in California years ago, um, PSCNG bill that says, the power mix that I get at my house, you know, has X percent nuclear, X percent gas, whatever. Because again, we're all getting the same power, but you know, the power that I'm buying um, is from renewable sources. Uh, and in my case, as I mentioned earlier, actually not necessarily just local, but uh, but that's okay because again, I'm, I'm I'm interested in the in the whole grid in my case. Okay, uh, and I believe on Green Mountain's website they do say that it's Rex and uh, includes National Wind Rex, which um, is not in the PCRE program. It doesn't include National Wind Rex. Okay, we're getting close to the end here. Um, a couple more questions left. Would it make sense to put the entire town, for example, municipal, commercial, and industrial into the RGA program and then bid it as a demand side resource into the PJM market? I'm it may be tricky because municipal, commercial, and industrial like load profiles would be different and hard to. That's a yeah. I mean, uh, this this you know, even though I used to work for a company that did a lot of that trading, um, you know, that wasn't so much my uh, 
my work, but uh, my guess is the load would probably not even you know, be enough. Um, I mean, if we had some heavy industrial base, uh, you know, like a city like Houston, maybe with, uh, or, or, you know, uh, um, down by the coast, you know, all these oil refineries and things like that, you know, they have such a, a, a high percentage of the load for that entire region that they actually often bypass retail power and just become basically wholesale power, you know, some very large users, like I think Apple computer um, actually applied basically to have a, a, a license to become basically an energy trader in the energy markets because they figured that way they could they could kind of cut out some of these, uh, you know, middle layers um, by going directly to the wholesale market. But without, um, you know, speaking out of turn, I think uh, uh, what we'd be talking about here in Princeton would be way too small to be to, to make sense. Thank you. Okay, what will be the um, price of the RECs purchased by the Princeton Community Renewable Energy Program? This information is needed to evaluate how much market incentive is provided by the purchase of RECs. I mean, honestly, uh, you know, I think what matters is the price uh, to consumer that is committed in the program. And that's what, the, you know, certainly I think the New Jersey statute around these, these programs is, is that the uh, you know, the provider has to commit to a certain rate structure and, and in this case savings for those who will be opted in at the 50% level and then clear pricing for consumers who want to opt up. Uh, you know, RECs, like many other commodities, they, you know, they, they're, uh, uh, they're tradable uh, in, in various kind of markets. There used to be carbon exchanges, but now they, uh, uh, there's different trading mechanisms. So the price will fluctuate anyway. Uh, and there might be disclosure as we mentioned earlier, maybe at the BPU or elsewhere as to kind of what the average price is in any given cycle or season. But, uh, uh, but again, what, what, you know, we, what, what we were focused on and needed to ensure was that we had a price commitment as to what the consumer price impact would be. And then, you know, how the, how the provider makes that price work in terms of what they spend on, you know, marketing versus facilities versus human resources versus things like recs. Um, that's for them to figure out. Okay. Um, can you clarify whether Green Mountain supplies you with megawatt hour generated by 100% renewable sources versus certificates that are a piece of paper? I mean, a certificate is a guarantee, if you will. I mean, you know, they certainly don't send me pieces of paper. Uh, uh, Again, the, these things are pretty well structured and regulated. So in New Jersey, like in about 17 other states, uh, you can buy power from somebody other than your local utility. Uh, and if you choose to buy power from somebody that makes certain claims like renewables, um, the way Green Mountain does, uh, the way they meet that requirement and the way they demonstrate that requirement is through the use of these certificates that are basically instruments to know that, again, for a megawatt hour of generation produced somewhere, a megawatt hour certificate was retired just once. And in this case, I mean, our, even though we, we have a couple of electric vehicles, you know, we don't use like megawatt hours worth of power uh, uh, too often. But, uh, but um, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the physical delivery, we're all getting the same power here in, <laughs> in the community. Whatever hits the grid is what hits the grid. But in terms of, uh, um, you know, what I'm paying for, it's, um, it's power um, generated from renewable sources as demonstrated by renewable energy credit that were bought and it retired in my name, if you will. Okay, um, well, um, uh, information on REC prices seems to be hidden from public view. Why is this? Um, <laughs> Probably because there's not too many people who have, you know, the appetite. It, it you know, they're pretty um, kind of wonky stuff. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I mean, again, these are well-regulated uh, uh, financial instruments uh, that operate on, on, you know, kind of financial markets. Um, uh, and you know, that information has got to be available somewhere. Uh, you know, again, is it super interesting to most people? No, which is probably why there's not a whole lot of. Uh, uh, um, you know, immediate transparency around it. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, there's, uh, again, these, these are kind of open markets uh, and uh, um, there's, there's no real secret behind it. Okay. 
Great. Well, we're um, pretty much up here to uh, eight o'clock. Um, are there any sort of final comments or wrap up that you'd like to, to say, Bruno, and to um, uh, reinforce any of the concepts you've been talking about and answering questions about tonight? Sure. I mean, you know, first of all, it's awesome to live in a community where people, you know, just take that level of interest. I think it's awesome to live in a community where, you know, um, everyone wants to ensure that what we're doing is is good and right and helpful. Um, I think we're all united in our in our um, you know concern and commitment to addressing uh, climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, but also things like air quality, which often also accompany uh, uh, certainly fossil based um, generations. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really gratifying to, to see this level of community involvement and, and also to acknowledge, you know, these things are, these things are weird. You know? <laughs> We're not used to that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they're changed and so change is uncomfortable. It's like, I'm not used to doing things this way. It's, it's like, how do I know it's real? And, and you know, uh, so these are, these are absolutely valid questions, important questions. You know, I want to commend, frankly, both, you know, the, the city, Sustainable Princeton, you know, all the work done by the, uh, you know, the subgroups of the climate action planning, you know, all the public consultation. I mean, this has been done, I think, really, uh, uh, by the book and, and, you know, with great interest in, in getting a lot of community engagement um, and, um, and continue to ask questions. And, and you know, uh, again, that's what we want is we want more and more uh, community involvement and, in, you know, how do we address both, you know, our ability to reduce our own footprint uh, in addressing climate change? How do we contribute to the national and regional discourse on you know, public investments and private investments in, in cleaner and low carbon transition uh, uh, projects. And so um, this is, this is, this is great. Uh, love to see this, uh, th this level of commitment. And, and again, totally fine to be confused because these things are, they're, they're weird, they're new. And, uh, uh, you know, it's still kind of a pioneering thing, you know, even though many communities have been doing this for, you know, about certainly about 10, 12 years in California, just a handful of years here in the Northeast, Many communities have not gone there yet, so we're still kind of at the avant-garde. So you look around and you're like, eh, why is this, isn't anybody else doing this? And you know, it's it's okay. Like it's totally normal, and uh, um, you know, we're, we'll we'll just be able to help others along as they as they move along that curve. Uh, but uh, you know, pioneers uh, sometimes uh, you know have to kind of make uh, make their own way and come up with their own answers too. Great. Well, thank you so much, Bruno, and thank you to uh, the audience members and for your questions. Um, stay tuned for future Ask Me Anything sessions. Um, uh, we hope to get those scheduled soon and made available. And I wish everyone a good night and stay safe and stay home. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.